Welcome to Ask Kalefi, the podcast that dives into real-life problems that plumbing and HVAC technicians face in the field. We're your hosts from the Kalefi Tech Support Team. I'm Greg Tubbs. And I'm Dan Furkus. Welcome. We look forward to sharing some stories from our tech calls and using our background and expertise to make your days a little easier. Hey there, welcome back. Uh, we're going to talk about some Legionella and domestic hot water today. How are you doing, Dan? We're doing good. How are you? Oh, can't complain. What have you been up to lately outside of work? Oh, not a whole lot. A lot of yard work. Yard work? Yeah, a lot of yard work. No fishing? A little no? bit of fishing. Okay, yeah. good. Yeah, you got to do a little bit of fishing to keep yourself sane every once in a while. Fortunately, more yard work than fishing. Yeah, you're going to have to change that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so... We have a guest speaker for today. We do. We're excited. Yep, we have Kevin Freed. He's our director of, of product management and tech support here at Kalefi. Yeah, I think you were saying he's like the Stella of Legionella. Yeah, he's the doctor of disinfection. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Kevin. Wow, it's hard to follow that. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, I mean, we hear a lot about Legionella and Legionella control in our industry. Um, I mean, every so often an article comes up of a hotel or a, a Legionella hospital case. or hospital. Some, yeah, yeah, something some. out there that they have a big Legionella breakout. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're hearing a lot about it. Uh, it's something that's been around forever. I mean, we start from the basics, right? It's a bacteria that's everywhere, all around us. It's in the lakes and streams, in the water. Uh, in in uh, even in the the building plumbing system, the premise plumbing, that bacteria gets in there from the municipalities or from the wells. Right, and uh, you know generally that bacteria isn't a problem. You can drink that water, and it'll go through your body, and it doesn't harm you. It's only a problem when that bacteria gets really concentrated, and then gets into your lungs. Right, yeah, uh, it gets airborne, doesn't it? Right, it, it likes to be um, warm and and moist and have oxygen and some food, and your lungs are a perfect environment for that. Right, absolutely. Yeah. What I'm, I'm going to play the dumb guy and ask some questions. <laughs> I can do that pretty well. So what are the ideal temperatures for Legionella to really flourish and, and grow? Well, room temperature, really anywhere from, say, 70 to 120 degrees. And, uh, you know, that's, that's water that's sitting in a pipe in a building is going to be at that temperature if it's not moving. And uh, if there is some um, corrosion in that pipe or a biofilm, and a little bit of oxygen, that Legionella is perfectly happy there. It's a great place to raise a family and proliferate. And uh, if it gets really concentrated, that's when it can be a problem. Right. So maybe a dead leg in a building where, you know, recirc line isn't moving that water through is a exactly. kind of a good environment for that, exactly. for that bacteria to grow. Would you say Legionella probably thrives at that higher temperature? It, it really grows and, and gets stronger through in that higher temperature, that 120? Well, any, anywhere within that range, really. If you have cold water, like water below 60 degrees, the bacteria is still there, but it won't grow. It, it won't. Uh, it's dormant. And anything above 122, uh, clinically speaking, will start to kill it. So the higher temperature will uh, begin to kill that Legionella. So if you get up to 130 or 140, then you start to kill that bacteria. Uh, and the higher temperatures will kill it faster. Okay. Yeah, I was kind of looking at it, and it looked like that 70 to 110 degree range was really a kind of a hot spot where that bacteria really grows. Yep. yep, exactly. How does someone get Legionella out of plumbing? I mean, obviously you say it, it can grow well in our lungs, so I think that's a good segue okay. into where it's, how it, how you can get it. Yeah, it almost have to become airborne, so I would assume maybe like in a shower or... Yeah, in fact, if you go back to where the name came from, the Legionnaire's disease was... Uh, it was named after a 1976 Legionnaires convention in Philadelphia. And what happened there was they had a, a cooling tower that was really infected with the bacteria, and that cooling tower was spewing that bacteria outside, and it was blowing all around the city, and a lot of people got sick from that. And bef prior to that, we didn't really understand what, what the whole issue was, but that's kind of the beginning of it all from 1976. And so now we know a lot about it. We know how it grows, how it proliferates, um, how it can make people sick. We have specific tests for it now, and we know a lot more uh, about it than we ever did. Right. Well, we're starting to see a lot more um, guidelines put in place or standards put in place for Legionella control in buildings. 
Right. And cooling towers are only one way to aerosolize the bacteria or the water droplets, right? Sure. So if you have a spa or uh, a water fountain in a hotel or in your shower, of course, these are other ways that you can get water droplets into your lungs, right? So if there is a high concentration of bacteria in any of those water droplets, you can get sick. And there are a lot of documented cases from uh, water decoration features in the lobby of a hotel, for example, and it's especially dangerous when you have uh, people that are uh, susceptible to disease. Like if you have an elderly facility or a, uh, a place where there are cancer patients or people that are really prone to getting sick easily, it doesn't take much. And so that's why we see some outbreaks in healthcare facilities, um, schools, hotels. Uh, you know, Greg, you mentioned a hotel. Yeah, in Atlanta, a, ho- a hotel had to shut down for, right, I think, right, a, a, yeah. a number of weeks because of yep. that. And it was a, a few people got sick and even died from that. So that's the issue when it gets into your lungs. Yeah, it's interesting. I, when I think of Legionella, because you know we're in the plumbing business, plumbing product business, um, I think about it strictly with domestic hot water and plumbing. But you're right, like a, a water feature. You yeah, know, any place where yeah. there's old stagnant water that just it's kind of being slowly right. recycled and never really flushed out or moved around. Right, and you think of like a fountain where they're moving that water and the droplets are becoming airborne. I mean, I suppose that could be inhaled and right and, and be right. a concern. And, and those those features like the water fountain or or even a hot tub, you know, those are treated with chemicals, right? right. Um, but in the you mentioned the domestic hot water recirculation. That's you know that's water that goes to our sinks and our faucets and our showers, and that's that's where we need to be particularly careful as you know plumbing professionals. Right. I think with the with the lockdown that we just came out of with the whole COVID, you had a lot of buildings sitting you know, not being used, with domestic water systems not being used. I mean, I think, you know, we, I know we focused pretty heavily on, on how to start those buildings back up and bring them back online. Right, right. What can happen is that when that water, let's say it comes from the municipality and it might be treated with monochloramine, well, that, that monochloramine degrades over time. So by the time that water gets to the building, it's gone through some piping and, you know, some, some, uh, probably some corroded pipes and it got warm and the, the effectiveness of that monochloramine is limited. So once that water gets to the building, there may or may not be much protection left. And if it sits in the building for a while, then it gets old. The monochloramine is basically gone, right? And then if you have those conditions we talked about earlier, that's when it gets dangerous. So what we need to do as plumbers is we need to understand that dead legs, and, that, and that's a piece of piping in, in the uh, potable water system that doesn't have movement, or uh, any any time water gets old, right? And how does the water get old? Well, we have now these very efficient fixtures, right? Our showers are very low flow, and we've been conserving water since the 90s, right? We always thought, well, that's really important to conserve the water. Well, there's another way to look at that now. You're conserving water, but what are you doing? You're making that water older. So that water might get to your commercial building and spend, you know, I don't know, a week or two weeks in the piping. And rather than being flushed out, when you're using a lot of water and sending it down the drain, that water now becomes dangerous. Sure. Yeah, I suppose it's sitting in the pipes longer, so it's also cooling off, too. By Cooling off or warming up, or even warm. the cold water. You know, if you have the cold water coming in and then it sits in some piping in a plenum right. somewhere, yeah. that water will easily get to 70, 75 degrees. Sure. Yeah, it's and not it, going to retain its its cold ground temperature of, you know, 50 or 48 degrees. It's, it's sitting now in room temperature air and through conduction it's it's warming up yeah it grows into an unsafe state right right and that's generally a bigger problem in commercial applications because in our homes we don't really need to worry about it too much because each of us use what 80 or 100 gallons a day on average and so we're using all the water in our house every day so unless you have a big lake house like greg does up in the north woods <laughs> right and he goes up there you know every uh, every month or two right. you know so when you get there you need to flush all that water out of there greg don't don't take a shower unless you've so re- you, replenished all that I water. Have a lake house that i don't even know about <laughs> <laughs> you guys have been going there haven't you well when you find it greg take okay. us along we will. <laughs> yeah. so we get that question sometimes what about residential and you typically right. it's not a problem cool what can we do to keep people safe? I, mean, I think we kind of touched on that, but I'm going to ask that question anyway. Well, we can all do something. The designers, you know, the folks that are the engineers that are designing our piping systems, they need to worry about uh, making sure that we don't have piping sections that will harbor 
uh, old water, right? So design around um, no dead legs. Uh, as, as an installer, we can make sure that we uh, keep our piping clean, that we do a really good flush. We want to keep the pipes as um, clean as we can to minimize corrosion and biofilm. Uh, and as, as a practitioner, you know, as a service person, just remember that uh, flushing is important. You know, flushing, don't, don't worry so much about flushing water when you're in a building where there are people that can get sick if they get some of this bacteria in their lungs. So, right, you can turn that water on, flush that system, keep that water moving. Exactly. And there are some really good materials out there to read. ASHRAE Guideline 188 is great. Uh, it talks about water management plans. So that, that guideline is meant for everyone, from the designers to the building users. And it talks about safe practices and what you can do to minimize the, the risk of Legionella d- uh, disease. And um, so it defines the water management plan. It doesn't really tell you what to do. It just says you need to have a team that's responsible. Uh, you need to have records of what's going on, stuff like that. Sure. So in an ideal situation, perfect world scenario, if are you designing a system, you know, what would you include in, in your plan to try and manage this, you know, manage le- Legionella control? Well, if you can keep the hot water hot, Mm-hmm. Okay. Make sure it's the piping is insulated. Keep it above 122. When you're if you're designing a recirculation system, which we all see in commercial, yeah. don't don't let that water anywhere in that loop get below 122. Even on the return leg coming back, if it, that water comes back at 90 degrees, then that section of the piping is dangerous. So make sure that you have high temperature storage. Store your water at 140 or more. Or if you have an instantaneous system, you know, deliver it at 140 or more. Mix it down if you need to uh, to make it safe, but don't let it get too cool. That's on the hot water side. And uh, that's really where we play, where, where Kalefi plays is on that hot water side. On the cold water side, that's kind of a different deal. You need to have some way of flushing everything sure. uh, periodically to keep the bacteria right. down. I know in talking at one point, um, when we talked about water quality in a building, isn't there some liability that falls back on the owner of that building? You know, if you if you looked at like a hospital or a, a multifamily unit to to ensure, I thought there was some liability that fell back on the owner to make sure that that water was safe. If the building owner or manager adds chemicals on their property, then they take ownership of that water system. So okay. that's really important to know. So if you're going to put in a, a um, chlorine additives or something else to treat the municipal water after it gets into your building, you need to be very uh, aware of that. Okay, so that's so. that's where thermal disinfection um, would be a, a safer safer route of killing the water without using chemicals. Right. When it comes to the the recirculation system, that's where we play, right? That's our, yep. that's our business. We want to make sure that we always have water above 122 in that whole system. Don't turn off your recirc pump. Keep the water moving, right? That that minimizes stagnation. And then um, employ what's called thermal disinfection. And we have a, a product that does this. It's an electronic mixing valve that will periodically and regularly automatically raise the temperature in that recirc system to a level that will kill the bacteria. And you can do this, for example, every night. Have the recirc water go from, say, uh, 130 up to 150 for 60 minutes, for example. And then that part of the piping... Whatever, whatever that water is circulating, that will um, uh, have Legionella control just by using temperature. So there's no chemicals involved. And they've been doing this in, in Europe for many, many years. It's not all that popular here in the U.S., but we're trying to educate people on how that works. It's a very uh, effective thing to do. It's very safe. And if you already have a master mixing valve, you're not adding any cost to the project. So there's no chemicals involved. Uh, you just raise the temperature every night, set it back down to normal, and the number one question that always comes up is, well, oh, gosh, we're going to have scalding water going through the system, yeah, right? Yeah, you have that potential. I was just going to so go there. Right. <laughs> the, most, the most important thing to know if you're going to do this is to have anti-scald valves everywhere at every fixture. And if you have those ASSE 1016 shower valves, if you have the ASSE 1070 anti-scald valves at all your janitor sinks or any point of use, you can do this safely. It's not a problem. Uh, right, you're protected at the point of use. Right. Yeah, nobody's yeah. going to get scalded. And you just, if you raise those temperatures for an hour every night and set them back to normal, 
uh, it's, it's actually a very uh, efficient and effective way to control the Legionella. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and uh, less liability for a building owner. Right. You're not adding, You're chemicals. Not adding chemicals. And the, the, the Legion Mix valve that we sell uh, has a built-in data logger, so the building owner, the manager, has records. So they have a recorded record, a database of the temperatures and what they've done. So they have records that they can show to someone if they ever have to. Mm-hmm. And uh, if you know, it, that's a way of meeting some of the requirements of ASHRAE 188 to make sure you document what you have. Right, so that protects uh, the owners or who's ever responsible from potential, you know, lawsuits or right. liabilities. Anyway, having the, having some record of what you've been doing. It's very helpful to have that that uh, added benefit with that product. It yeah. certainly is. Yeah. Well, I think we covered this topic really well. Yeah. Um, any closing final thoughts on it? No, I mean, there's a lot to talk about. I mean, I, I, I like talking about it, as you can tell, and there's a lot of great information. We can help you. Anybody who is interested, just give us a call here at Calafe. We have uh, some really good references. Our hydronics technical journals talk about it. We have uh, uh, magazine articles that talk about it, and we'll be more than happy to help anyone with, uh, with information uh, on this topic. Yeah, we'll certainly be, have more information to come in the future. Absolutely. That's it for now. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in. If you ever need help, please feel free to contact our tech support team anytime at techsupport.us at com, Or call us during our business hours at 7.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. Central Time at 414-238-2360.